well-being and multimorbidity. A lot of what I'm going to say to you this morning is derived from the longitudinal study of aging, TILDA. Um, and a little bit just a background to TILDA. It's, it, we started TILDA in 2006 when I returned to Ireland. Uh, we, we piloted it for four years. It's a nationally uh, representative population sample of people over the age of 50. So we, we, we have a spread at, at, the, at the initiation of the study of a representative population sample. So people 50 to 106 in the initial wave. And we see the same people, provided they're alive, every two years thereafter to have some sense of the process of aging at different stages of aging, but also it's, it's designed in such a way that it is representative of the population and therefore the data can be translated into policy meaningful data. We can say this is the prevalence of X in Ireland because of the way we've designed the study. So reassessed every two years, um, pilot 2006 to 2009, went into the field end of 2009, 2010, and, and we see people every two years. And what it means is we have a tapestry of aging in Ireland and none of the information is collected in silo. We don't, don't just age in one system. We don't just age economically. We don't just age socially. All of the different aspects of our lives impact on the biological process of aging. So we collect data on everything, health, physical, mental health, income, assets, social network, social engagement, household structure, childhood experiences. We have a whole group of people looking on the impact of childhood on, on how one ages work, retirement, and because of the design, we're able to look at the transition into retirement and the impact that that has on mental and physical health and biology, education, and if I was asked, what are the two things for successful aging? In, in the life course, I would say education, education, education. And in adult life, physical activity, physical activity, physical activity. If we had to pick one from each of those timeframes in our, in our life. Family networks, very important, nutrition, and most recently, genes. So we can inform policy from this data. And it's the Department of Health who are now funding the study through the HRB. And then we get, they fund the core data collection and a little bit of research. And then the rest of the research is funded by HRB, National Institute for Health in the States, because we're part of a family of longitudinal studies. Um, European grants, H2020, most recently, uh, EIT Health, etc. So novel research, policy, and the study has also been designed to be comparable with now 30 other longitudinal aging studies worldwide. And I'll show you some of that with respect to multimorbidity. So let's just take a step back with respect to aging and demographics, because the demographics are changing hugely and changing in a consistent way year on year. For most of humanity, about three to 4% of a population lived to 65 and beyond. And a good example of that is 400 years BC. Obviously, Socrates, a wonderful philosopher, he himself was forced to terminate his life, um, aged 71, because of his radical writings and philosophies. But his three best friends, also philosophers and poets, lived to 80, 79, and 75, 400 BC. And of course, there are probably many more living to these ages at that time, but we don't know about them. These, these, these persons' writings have remained with us, and that's how we know. So look at this, this um, trajectory for average life expectancy and how much it's been increasing since we've really accurate records in the 1800s. Year on year, this is a linear relationship between life expectancy and increasing age over time. In the last 200 years, our expectancy has doubled. And what it, what it actually means, what it means is we're, we're living on average 2.5 years longer with each decade. I'll, I'll translate that into another, into another way. A baby girl born this year will live on average three months longer than her sister born last year. 
So that, that's what it means. And another sibling born to that family will live three months longer on average than the previous and six months longer than the previous. That's what it, that is what it actually translates to. And this demographic change is global. It's happening all over. And in developing countries at a much accelerated speed, which is a big problem for them because they don't have the infrastructure. So in France, for example, it's taken 158 years for the doubling of the population over the age of 65 at a population level. In China, it's 21 years. So getting the fabric from a policy <coughs> perspective of social and health infrastructure developed over that very short period of time for this aging demographic globally is a big problem. The other issue, of course, is that fertility rates are dropping globally. And, and you can see here that in 2012, worldwide, the number of people under the age of five was superseded by the number over the age of 65. And this is continuing now, this, this huge gap between these two uh, demographics. So the biggest increase we're going to see in our clinical practice is over 65, yes. Over 85, yes. But a big increase in the oldest old, particularly. Now, when I was a young uh, junior doctor, a hundred year old on the ward, we'd all go up to have a look. This was really unusual. It isn't unusual anymore. It's not unusual to have people in their nineties at all. How are we doing in Ireland? Japan is still the longest uh, lived <clears throat> population worldwide. And we'll come on to why that might be followed by Switzerland, Singapore, Australia, Spain, Iceland, etc. We come in world globally at 19. And the life expectancy for women is, is, is higher than men, but, but, but actually that, that gender difference is, is narrowing. So it's 83.4 for women and 79.4 for men at the moment in Ireland. And I'll translate that into something more meaningful in terms of your clinical practice. That's expectancy at birth. If you make it to 65, this is how much longer you can expect to live. If you make it to 75, an extra 12 and 14 years on average. And if you make it to 85, another seven and nine years on average. So that translates into a life expectancy if you are 65 of 84 and 86. If you're 75 of 87 and 89. And if you have a patient in front of you who's 85, they're, they're, they, are, they have a good chance of living to 92 and 93. So in terms of interventions and assessments, this should be your projection. Why? Why are we living longer? What's changed over that period of time? We don't actually have all of the explanation for this. Certainly better healthcare, immunization, antibiotics, better quality of life, better quality of food and water and hygiene, housing, lifestyle, drops in fertility rates, more prosperity. See what will happen now with the new election. But anyway, more prosperity make a difference and contribute to longevity. But it doesn't, they, this doesn't explain the whole picture and we're still trying to establish why there may have been, um, why there may be those changes. Why, why, why we age at all? What, what happens at a biological level that, that causes aging? Animal models age at different rates. There's a lovely uh, correlation between an animal's heart rate and life expectancy, but that it doesn't appear to translate into, into humans. But let's look at some long lived animals and try and understand what's, what's the background to why they're living longer. This is the Antarctic sponge, immobile creature, very slow growths, very, very, uh, hardly any movement at all. You recognize maybe this from some colleagues in your office besides sitting beside it. <laughs> 1,550 years is the oldest known um, uh, age of an Antarctic sponge. That's, that's remarkable. 
The, the oldest mammal is the bowhead whale, two, 211 years. And this jellyfish possibly has eternal youth, no, no defined lifespan, because it, it morphs from polyp to adult to polyp again. So no apparent limit to, to lifespan. So you can imagine that understanding the biology of these animals will help to inform human studies on why we're aging at a biological level. And one of the things that all of these animals share in common is resistance to oxidative stress. Now I'm gonna try and take this right down to a very basic level so that, so that you understand what is meant by that because I did an interview once, I mean, I'm certainly not name dropping when I say this name, because I wouldn't value him very highly, but uh, with Ivan Yates and, and uh, he, you know, we were talking about some paper we had out and he said, oh God, don't tell me you're gonna go on again about food and nutrition and exercise. So, so since then I've thought, okay, I, people are tired of hearing that without being told why, why those behaviors change what's happening biologically. And really oxidative stress is very key to this. I like to think of a cell as a washing machine. It produces energy, which is why our mitochondria are so very important. So the whole function of the billions of cells in your body is to produce energy. My heart cells are producing the energy for my heart to pump. My blood vascular cells are producing the energy for flexibility within my vascular system to pump, to continue to assist the heart in pumping the blood around the system. My muscle cells are producing the energy just to allow me to stand and to walk and to move my hands and my head. My brain cells use 25% of my body's metabolism compared to most animals, which are five to 10%. And they're keeping me hopefully active until I stop talking in 30 minutes or whatever. So energy, 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 that's what cells are all about. So it takes in the nutrients that we eat from the system. <clears throat> it takes these nutrients, it produces energy from these nutrients, but then the byproduct of that energy production is toxins, which are toxic to the cells, poisonous to the cells. So think of a washing machine. The energy production is the actual washing. Clean water is coming in to facilitate the energy production, but you have to get rid of the dirty water really quickly out of the cell so that more clean water can come in and this whole energy cycle can continue. That's the cell. If we fail to maintain that level of balance between energy production, taking products from the system into the cell, producing energy from those dietary products, getting rid of the toxins, then we get a slow background inflammation in the cell if that, if that system goes, becomes unbalanced. Now we need inflammation. If we get an infection or we get an insult to the body, of course, we need to mount an inflammatory response. It's a really good thing. But chronic inflammation, if inflammation doesn't go back to a baseline, chronic inflammation we know is toxic to cells. And that's actually what eventually causes cells to become sick and to die. That's what, that's, you know, aging in a nutshell, a cellular nutshell. Two factors influence oxidative stress. One is our genetic makeup and the other is environmental factors. Now, show of hands, how many of you think that our genes contribute to 70% of how we age, aging process? Okay, very good, but about, I'd say, 40% of the room, 50%, uh, 30%, 20%, okay. So genes contribute to 20% of lifespan, lifespan. They obviously uh, contribute to a lot more of other things, but lifespan, 20%. 80% of our, of our cellular aging, biological aging, is environmental, environmental factors. And we know this from 
from twin studies and twins that have been exposed at birth to being to growing up in very different environments. There's some lovely, lovely large twin studies now in Europe. And uh, well, I suppose England is part of Europe, but anyway, England and Europe. Look, look at these, look at these men. <coughs> these photographs were taken when these men were all 58. I, he, he was born looking like that, I suspect. <laughs> he, does, he looks like a baby or a baby's bottom. But, but, but look at the difference between those two and him and him. He looks quite healthy and George Clooney. What can we say? But they're so different. Now I'm going to introduce you to the concept of heterogeneity and what influences heterogeneity as, 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 we, as we get older. And it's predominantly uh, environmental factors that which contribute to this variation in human beings. It starts really, really early on this 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 influence of environmental factors this is a study from colleagues in New Zealand the Dundee uh, longitudinal study in aging it, it's different to our study in that they took a couple of thousand people all born in the same year and they are now 45 and they've been following them every four years since birth so it's a birth cohort study rather than our uh, design of study um, and at the time that they measured their biological aging they were all 38. So their chronological age, their age number was 38. But their cellular, we have ways of looking at how old the cell is. Remember the energy and the toxins? We have a way of, an inflammation, we have ways of looking at that, which is biological aging, epigenetics. And look at the spread of biological age in people who were all the same chronological age. So this is biological age. This is the percentage. Some people, were biologically 28 at age 38, but some were almost 50 biologically. And the factors which differentiated biological aging in people aged 38 were childhood poverty, stress, mental health issues, drug abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and um, low physical activity, smoking, alcohol, drugs. All of those factors, external factors over which we've control at a societal and a personal level, influence biological aging in these kids. In fact, in most of our work, smoking contributes hugely to biological aging in the Irish uh, cohort populations. So heterogeneity, we see the same heterogeneity in this study. Now, we do, we do physical measures as well as an hour and a half's interview, et cetera, as part of TILDA. And there's a self-completion questionnaire for personal questions. This is a timed up and go test. Terribly simple test. Measures the executive function and gait speed. So you sit down, stand up, walk a fixed distance, turn around and sit down again. How simple is that? How easy is that? And how much variation could there possibly be in such a simple test? This much variation. This is age and this is the speed. So the, 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 the narrower this window here, the faster the person completed these tests. So at age 50, this is the speed at which people did that timed up and go test. As people got older, the speed of the test slowed for some, for some, and there was much more variation, heterogeneity in how the test was delivered. It, but in fact, look at this. Half of those 85 years of age performed at the same level as those aged 50. And a quarter actually performed faster than half of the 50 year olds. There's more disparity in women, more of a spread in, in, in the, in the in the variation of gait speed, that simple, very simple test. So we see heterogeneity in many different things. With respect to epigenetics, which is what I showed you in the Dunedin study, we've recently looked at epigenetic biological profiles in the TILDA test. These are very expensive studies to do. We've done them on 444, and we've done four different met metrics, including, this is the one I was saying to you earlier on, Doug, the newer Grim Age, which measures uh, 
over a thousand CPG sites, uh, sites that we know are pertinent to aging, whereas this original one measured, say, 80, this was 300 and this was about 500. So this is the most recent one. But look how much variation there is in, in that biological profile in the context of walking speed and look how closely associated it is with that timed up and go test which i've which i've just shown you it actually isn't the timed up and go <coughs> test it's another walking speed test we do a gateway but it's the same principle so we're seeing also biological markers we're seeing huge variation in biological markers we're seeing them in phys physical tests and we're actually seeing them in in the aging the epigenetics the aging at a cellular at a cellular level in the TILDA study. And this just shows the same degradation in terms of biomarker, epigenetic biomarker for frailty score, freed frailty score in, in this cohort. So big spread, even in frailty and nice for us reassuring that these biomarkers are actually measuring what it says on the tin in terms of some of the physical measures we use. These are the environmental factors that we know are associated with aging that are antioxidants. So they're, they're making sure those toxins get out of the cells and that this background inflammation doesn't take place in the cells. Uh, they include diet, calorie restriction, exercise, uh, redu reduce stress, volunteering, relationships, believe it or not, keeping weight down, having a purpose in life. All of those factors, imagine those sorts of factors influence by healthy aging, influence aging and well-being, how we age. Because we know from cellular studies that they reduce inflammation. aging. How are we doing in Ireland? <clears throat> weight is a huge problem. Overweight is a huge issue for us, for us in Ireland. And, you know, if, if we take BMI, we've, we've done three different measures in the TILDA study. Waist hip ratio, waist circumference, and BMI. I'm just showing you BMI here. But for people over the age of 50, and the time this data pertains to a mean age of 64 for the population, over the age of 50, 43% were overweight, a BMI of up to 29.9. 36% obese, obese, over 30 and only 21% of our population in Ireland are normal. When this data came out first, I thought, it can't be. And I remember sitting in Euston, and I, I just sat and watched people and counted, for people I reckoned were over 50, how many were normal weight. And just do it. it. It pans out. I think we've become so used to looking at people who are overweight and obese that, that we this is kind of our norm. But in terms of outcomes, which is what all of this is based on, negative outcomes for obesity, this should not be the case. And this is something we can do something about at a population level. I think I've got some nice brain blood flow data to show you uh, later on uh, with respect to that. I think I have. So that's, that's diet and calorie restriction. Calorie restriction, I, I haven't brought the slides today, but it's a, it's a whole lecture in itself, but just know and, and have a look afterwards at the different regimes for calorie restriction. You can do eight hour fasts or 16 hour fasts. In animal models, where for, uh, rhesus monkeys who are 20 years old, the monkey who, who, for whom calories have been restricted to 40% of daily intake since birth has a decelerated aging process of 40% and an extended lifespan of 40%. So calorie restriction in animal models works. At a biological level, at a cell level, there's evidence it works in humans, but we, we, the, the studies haven't been going on and aren't large enough yet for long enough in a randomized fashion to know whether it extends lifespan in humans. But there's very strong biological evidence to show that calorie restriction works. Um, so exercise, what about exercise? And obviously that's very core to, to this group. How many of us are exercising? We have accelerometry data in TILDA. I'm not showing you that data. I'm showing you very simply 
30 minutes brisk walk five times a week. How many of our population in Ireland are adhering to that simple metric? What we're calling, we're calling that high physical activity here. This is virtually nothing during the week of, 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 of de dedicated physical activity. And this is in between the two. This is some of the work that you asked me about, Gabriel McKee, that she was involved in with us. A third, a third, a third. So a third of people aren't moving at all in Ireland and only one third are meeting that minimum of um, aerobic exercise a week. And this bears out in our accelerometry data, et cetera, which measures over a week how much exercise people are taking. There was a, there was a Public Health England uh, report recently, and it showed that 60% of people in the UK were spending more time sitting on the toilet than they were walking. I don't know how. It's a very large population study of 40,000 people over the age of 40, so they were busy. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I think about it. I mean, when I, again, when I heard that statistic, I thought that can't be right, but it is. Think about it. So we need to get walking, physical activity, key. We've looked at cerebral blood flow in some MRI studies in the TILDA sample where we've done arterial spin labeling. And this is work done by a lovely, wonderful bioengineer, um, Silva Knight in, in the group. So this is how much, I mean, it's, it's a complex slide, but let me, I can simplify this. This is how much uh, blood flow declines with age. But for different groups, who, are, who have a high BMI, waist circumference, or waist hip ratio, they all drive reductions in cerebral blood flow more than age, more than age. So they have a big impact. Now, that's number one. Number two, this one shows how physical activity attenuates that negative impact on, on your brain blood flow of being obese or overweight. So this is a body max index of over 30. That's your obese group. This is uh, uh, up to 29.9, so that's overweight. This is your waist hip ratio group, and this is the waist circumference. So for people who are, you remember uh, in, the, in, the, in the, the two categories of overweight but not obese, say, or sorry, or overweight or not obese, and this is your three categories of physical activity, high physical activity attenuates the negative effect of body mass index on, on cerebral blood flow, even in the 46% who are overweight. So that's, that's a good news story. If you have high physical activity, that's just 150 minutes of fast walking per week, the 30 minutes, five times a day. If you have high physical activity, the, the negative impact on brain blood flow and obesity is a significant risk factor, remember, for dementia, vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. It, high physical activity attenuates, modifies, reduces significantly the negative effect of being obese or overweight. And, and, and similarly for physical activity of um, on people with excessive waist circumference and waist hip ratio. So that's a good news story. So with respect to multimorbidity, <coughs> I said that we've we're designed the study so that we can compare our data with other studies. And this just gives you an example of comparisons with Canada, the USA, Ireland, and England. So England had 7.9 people in similar waves of each of their studies. So, so around the same period of time. So uh, it was baseline for the Canadian study and they have a huge study, 36,000 funded by the Canadian government. The US study, so they have about 12,000 altogether, 10 in this particular sample. Our study, there were 6,000 in this, uh, at this particular wave um, of the 8,500 we started with. And we're refreshing the sample this year by 2,500 people aged 50 to 58. And this is wave six of the English longitudinal. So this data was all taken at the same time in these studies. And we, we, used, a, a, um, we used a machine learning technique one of our biostatisticians to actually see, uh, to answer the following question. 
multimorbidity we know is very becomes very common as people get older. 80% of our sample had two or more diagnoses over the age of 50, 80%. To give you a flip of that, we asked how many people over the age of 50 in Ireland are on no drugs and have no known diseases? And it's 12.6%. No drugs and no known diseases over the age of 70, 2.3%. So they're kind of super agers, right? It's unusual not to be on drugs or not to have another diagnosis. Multimorbidity is the norm. Multimorbidity means two or more comorbidities, diagnoses. When we, when we looked at the spread of multimorbidity between the different countries, this, this, is, this is quite an interesting disease pattern. So, and I'll take you very simply through this. So, so these are percentages prevalence. That, that's what the spiders network is. And the further out the tapestry, if you like, goes, the more prevalent the disorders are. So blue is just a high probability of having any of these diseases. And, and yellow is a low probability. So this is in the over 50s in the US, the proportion of people who've got no diseases. Now, not no medications, because they didn't have medication uh, noted in, in the US, but no, no known diagnoses. But let's look at these other complexes, this green one here, for example, here. Green, can you see it there in the background? That's high blood pressure. That's people who have high blood pressure coupled with diabetes, coupled with arthritis, coupled with angina, MI or stroke, in other words, cardio metabolic, yeah? Cancer or lung disease and psychiatric illnesses. Okay, so that's that complex. This one is hypertension and again arthritis and again osteoporosis, psychiatric illness or cancer. And that's the red. So that's this complex, quite common. And this one here is high blood pressure, diabetes, arthritis, psychiatric illness and cancer, 37%. And that's that, that's, I have to work it out here, that's that orangey one. That one there. You see it there? The point here is diseases don't occur in isolation. These are the common multimorbidities that group together when we're seeing a disease. So when you're seeing the message from this paper that we've submitted to JAMA as it happens, when you see someone with arthritis, when you see someone with arthritis, according to our data in the USA, they are also likely to have one of these disease complexes, but arthritis is common to virtually all of our, to all of our multimorbidity groupings. So if they've got arthritis, they might fall into the high blood pressure, diabetes, you know, angina, other cardiovascular, lung or psychiatric, or hypertension, osteoporosis, psychiatric, or diabetes, arthritis, psychiatric, and cancer. So it's not enough just to look at somebody's arthritis. You have to think of the whole person. You have to think of the other things that might be going on. That's one issue. The second issue is how interesting is this in terms of what's the underlying common mechanism that's, that's triggering these multi-morbid clusters. That's the USA. Canada just know that they have a similar pattern of disease clusters to the USA. And again, just to bring, bring to your attention, um, where's psychiatry here? It's here, sorry, I've knocked it out with my thing. Psychiatry is this one here blue they're very you know look look it's almost out to beyond 50 percent 75 percent they're very common in the usa quite common in in canada england different pattern altogether so now we're seeing angina stroke diabetes myocardial infarction and arthritis arthritis as 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 as, as that sort of multi-morbid cluster very little psychiatry, and I've marked, blocked it out here, very little in psychology or psychiatric illnesses, et cetera. So again, similar disease clusters, hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, but no psychiatry in there now in this 21%. Arthritis, osteoporosis, psychiatry there, 25%. Hypertension, diabetes, arthritis, osteoporosis, a lung or psychiatry, 13. And low probability of disease, 32%. High probability of disease, 8%. So similar patterns in, in Canada and the USA. 
uh, sorry, in, 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 I didn't show you Canada in the USA, in the USA and Canada, this is England and this is Ireland. Pretty similar pattern in Ireland, not as much, not as much in terms of the cardiac um, disease profile, but a more of, a, more of a, a, a similarity between our clustering pattern than the USA. And what's interesting is in these countries, their adult obesity prevalence trend and childhood obesity occurred much earlier than ours. So you've got Canada, England, Ireland, and USA here. Okay, that's USA. This is Ireland. So although I said, you know, there's a lot of obesity, which there is, etc., we're still behind in terms of the prevalence in these other countries in childhood obesity, but rising rapidly since 1975, rising rapidly since 1975. And we, we, we've hypothesized that the different disease trajectories in the, in, the, in the countries and the clustering of multimorbidity is being driven by this childhood obesity, which occurred earlier in, in the USA and is at very high levels now in, in the USA, but we're, we, we will get there. We're behind the curve now. So my message here is it's childhood obesity we need to be, we need to be dealing with now if we're preparing for our aging future in Ireland. Good news story. Finish with some good news. Things that you can do which are beneficial are volunteering after retirement uh, and, and when you're preparing for retirement, you have to be prepared. If you're going to retire, the worst thing you can do is not have anything afterwards, have no purpose in life. One day purpose, one day none. I, I, I spoke uh, to, uh, it was a patient, a retired ambassador, and he told me, a re I think a very sad story. He said, one day I was doing very high level negotiations I better not say in which country, because so, you may know very, who he is. In very, but very high levels of negotiation in this major global um, uh, economy, uh, representing Ireland. And he said that was a Thursday. On a Saturday, I was packing uh, cardboard boxes to head back to Ireland. And he said, I felt invisible. And I was suddenly nobody, having been somebody. And he was just making the point that he wasn't prepared for that. And he had never anticipated. He kept driving it right up to the very end. So it's terribly important to prepare for retirement. The negativity of not preparing has a biological influence. Um, and that's one of the, one of the factors why um, diseases increase after retirement in, in cohorts. So volunteering, social participation are some of the things that can happen. Looking after grandchildren actually has a hugely positive benefit on, on quality of life, on well-being, on mental health. And there are people who uh, prepare for retirement, but after retirement or in later years, engage, socially engage, are significantly less depressed and also have a better quality of life. The Nun study was a fabulous study done on 678 Sisters of Notre Dame by David Snowden and his group in the USA some years ago. And there was a the cohort of nuns who had gone into a convent more or less around the same time. They were all in their 80s when he decided to study them. And he followed them like we're doing prospectively um, until death and they all volunteered uh, for brain and other uh, autopsy um, um, examinations, post-mortem of course. Um, um, which has really informed the whole area of cognitive aging and dementia, it's made a huge contribution. And one of the lo lovely things he was able to do is go back over there, um, the, the, before they actually enter the novitiate, they spent a year teaching um, as a kind of a practicing nun, practicing novice. Uh, teaching with with and uh, but anticipating that after that year they would they would uh, uh, be accepted into the convent and they were being I suppose evaluated during that year. I can't remember there was a name for for that year candidate year. So during their candidate year, after their candidate year, they were invited to write a letter which which was kept in the record. So he had access to all of these letters, and he was able to actually look at their attitude. I don't think I've. I don't think I've kept the letters. I, I don't have it in this particular presentation. But you had two, he was able to actually look at 
at some of the nuns who had positive emotional attitudes. And, um, you know, they'd say, I had a lovely year in my candidacy. The children were great. I learned an awful lot. And I'm really looking forward to God's graces in the coming years and God's love. And that was positive emotional attitude. And then there was one, I taught Latin and Greek and mathematics for a year. And now with the grace of God, I'm going to, da, da, da. I, I, certainly as a, as a school child, I would have preferred to go to the first nun if I got into trouble. Then the second nun, the, this, this was rigid and kind of what we call it, kind of a negative emotional um, impact. And they found at post-mortem, the nuns who had the same neuropathology of Alzheimer's disease, the same plaques and tangles that we see in Alzheimer's disease, the same burden of neuropathology. The nuns who had the positive attitudes when they came into the, into the, as, uh, uh, their, from their candidate year versus the negative, these nuns manifested the clinical signs of dementia. These did not. And then there's been a, a that, that triggered a whole swathe of research about attitude and perceptions of aging, etc. And, 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 and the bottom line from that research is if you stay mentally active, intellectually curious, and have a positive attitude in life, you age better. You are biologically long, younger than your chronological age. Now, this is really hard to do in the context of our current society, where ageism is rife. Ageism is rife in our institutions. I mean, I have to fight to get anything academic in the context of gerontology because they're, uh, they're old. Uh, so so there's, we're, there's ageism everywhere. Ageism in our media, when our president was, was, was going for a second uh, term of office, I kept a newspaper he article heading, headline, which said, which said, do we really want a doddery old man in the Oris? It would be illegal to say that about race. It would be illegal to say that about sex, but we can say it about age. So we really need to crack this whole ageism attitude. So in summary, social engagement, relationships, laughter, all contribute to depressing biological inflammation and a better biological aging. How you perceive yourself aging, actually, I haven't shown you that data, but we've shown that people who perceive themselves as younger than their chronological age, eight years later, were physically and mentally, with our objective tests, younger. They performed better. So perceptions matter. Exercise matters, not just aerobic exercise, but muscle strengthening exercise programs are really important after the age of 40. Diet, vitamin D uh, in Ireland, 50% of the population are deficient in winter and 30% are deficient in summer. We need supplementation. Use it, don't use it, don't lose it. Keep the brain active and curious. Have a purpose, have a purpose. Sleep, and I know there's a speaker this morning on sleep. Sleep is really important. We've, 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 a couple of people looking at sleep in the TILDA study and the impact uh, independent it has of other confounders. And, and know your blood pressure, know your cholesterol, know your diabetes status, and obviously weight. So thank you. And I just want to acknowledge Chuck Feeney, who started, who funded initially the Longitudinal Study in Aging. And given where I am today and the wonderful philanthropic support this organization receives, without his philanthropic leverage, we wouldn't have tilled now. So he leveraged the study up to 2013. <coughs> And since then, we've been independent and able to be independent. And he gave us 50% of the funding needed for the study up to 2013. The other 50 we got from other sources. And now we're independent of, of, of that. But he, he's made a huge contribution to the fabric of Irish society, both, both children and adults, and indeed North-South uh, negotiations, which he was involved in from, from get-go, very quietly, in the background. So thank you. Thank you.